This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today I have the honor of interviewing former UFC welterweight champion, UFC 16 welterweight tournament winner, the founder of Militich Fighting Systems, Conspiracy Farm host, and UFC Hall of Famer, Pat Militich. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great, brother. Thanks for having me on. No problem. I'm a big fan of not only you, but a lot of the fighters that you've trained over the years. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. To start things off, uh, I know you're into the conspiracies now, and there's a big topic right now about this coronavirus overreaction. I understand there's something like a 98% recovery rate 8 billion people in the world, 100,000 or so deaths, but everything's locked down here and the uh, economy is going to hell. What are, what are your thoughts on what's happening here? Well, I mean, look, um, I mean, I've followed conspiracies, honestly, uh, from the time I was probably five years old, I was exposed to Nixon taking, off, taking us off the gold standard and putting us on what's called the petrodollar, where all countries had to have American greenbacks to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, and that's what made our, our uh, economy so strong. But it also uh, made it through a very short-lived monetary system, the American greenback, uh, and we are unfortunately now watching the death of the American dollar, most likely. Um, if people had been paying attention, they would have realized that uh, for several years now, Deutsche Bank, uh, Wells Fargo, and many other global banks were circling the drain. Um, their stocks had gone from like $70 down to like five bucks. Um, they were so um, over leveraged with billions upon billions, tens of billions, up to trillions of dollars. Uh, the derivatives market, the derivatives bubble was four times larger than the entire world's economy. Um, and this is all due to the irresponsible and moronic quantitative easing that the bankers did, that the, that the globalists did by injecting Billions of dollars in after the 2008 housing collapse. Instead of letting people go bankrupt, these companies go bankrupt. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, which are subsidized by the United States uh, government and the automakers, let them file bankruptcy, restructure with their with their employees, with the unions, with all of that, and just let it naturally reset. Instead, these morons injected trillions of um, fictitious fiat. Uh, digital digital currency into the system with keystrokes and blew the bubbles up bigger and now you know we were we were set to have a um, Wall Street stock market collapse this spring uh, we were calling it a lot of other people were calling it Peter Schiff who's a brilliant economist who called the 2008 collapse uh, we've had him on the show he was calling it uh, that it was gonna happen this spring but little did we know that our lovely politicians and globalists and elites would use the cover of a global pandemic um, to make an excuse for it. So uh, anybody that's, look, I'm not discounting the fact that 100,000 plus people have died of this. Um, I had it in January. Most of my production crew had it in mid-January. I brought it home to my kids and my wife. My wife was pretty sick also. I was hit pretty hard. It sounded like two bowls of soup for 10 days, 14 days, and, and I had violent shakes for a couple days. I, I was I was hit very hard. Um, luckily, all of us pulled through it, um, and uh, uh, they did much easier than I did. But nonetheless, um, look, man, people people are talking about, you know, narratives that the media sets. Uh, the first thing that I saw of this uh, was when they, on the mainstream news, posted a picture of a bowl of soup with a German, German shepherd sized fucking bat hanging out of it and saying that Chinese were eating bats and that's how this started. Immediately I went, wow, they're really trying to sell this as that's the narrative. Um, and then it was a uh, meat market in, in uh, uh, Western or Eastern China. Um, look, we know that we have 25 bioweapons labs that encircle Eurasia. Many other developed nations have bioweapons labs. We have the ability to create bioweapons, viruses that target specific DNA. That means we can kill Chinese if we want. We can kill Africans if we want with specific viruses. It'll go after and target them. 
uh, and all the all the scientists that work within those laboratories have diplomatic immunity, which means they can carry or ship anything they want, and it cannot be searched. So that that should tell you something right there. Also, I'm not saying that I'm 100% convinced that this was lab created, but when a Harvard professor gets arrested with three Chinese nationals who were scientists from from Wuhan University, also, and this guy was traveling back and forth constantly. Um, and they were arrested with biomaterial on them. Um, it, it, it's, it gets a little fishy. And on top of that, now stories are coming out, uh, legitimate reports, uh, that that Harvard professor, that asshole who was uh, playing games with, with uh, millions of people's lives with these, with these um, bioweapons, uh, was funded millions upon millions of dollars from the uh, United States State Department. So... Um, people, people need to wake up a little bit and understand that this is not about a virus. This virus, uh, in comparison to other pandemics globally throughout history, is a midget. Um, you know, it's been almost a year. This thing started probably in September in China. It was here at least in November. I know plenty of people that had it in November here. Um, and we've got 100,000 people that have died in eight, eight months, nine months, whatever it's been. Look, a small pandemic kills a million people in a year, um, so 10 times this amount, but yet we are shutting down the entire economy of the Western civilization, of Western civilization, um, doesn't make sense. The, the response does not uh, make sense compared to the numbers. What would your response be if, if this was a 100% legitimate thing? And and you you had it, so you know what it's like. What do you think a more appropriate response would be? Tell all elderly people stay home, do not go out. Um, you got to protect the, the elderly people with infants. Also, you know, have to be very careful. Don't expose those people to that. And go out and if you don't have pre-existing conditions. Also, uh, go out, uh, conduct your life as normal. Go to work, uh, do what you normally do. You're going to catch it. Um, you know, most most of these pandemics, once the society is exposed to it, from what scientists we've had on our show say, two to three weeks, it, it ramps up, it comes in, it peaks, and about a three week to four week um, uh, phasing out of it, and it's gone through the gone through um, the population, and there's natural herd immunity created from it, and uh, you don't have Bill Gates pushing mandatory vaccines. Uh, for you to be able to go to work or get on a plane and have your your uh, Nazi certified travel papers. Have you heard the report that Sports Illustrated put out yesterday, saying it's unlikely any mass spectator sports are going to take place in front of crowds for another year to year and a half when the vaccines are out? Well, you know what I would say to that is that I'm supposed to fight Michael Nunn um, in June, June sixth. And if the quarantines are lifted um, and we can pull it off, we're going to do it. Um, and Sports Illustrated and all the other people can kiss my ass. Uh, Michael, Nunn are, I, I, Michael Nunn and I are going to do it. And people will gather. Look, man, they are they are restricting First Amendment, restricting Fourth Amendment. I'm American. We have uh, something called the Constitution and the amendments that uh, give me the right uh, to drive where I want, to travel without being harassed, um, to be able to assemble and to express uh, freedom of thought and uh, look man Americans are getting fed up with this um, they Americans got red pilled by uh, Jeffrey Epstein's so-called murder um, and you talk about you talk about getting red pilled from this um, Americans and many many Canadians are getting red pilled I'm, I'm I know that the same feeling is is per pervading up there of you know we've had enough of this shit uh, and enough of the government big government control man it's time to take things back what type of fight is this that you're supposed to have in June? Uh, he's going to let me kick. He was he was the best pound for pound boxer on the planet for about four years. Um, for those that don't know who Michael Nunn is, um, he uh, he truly was. He was he was incredible, um, and I've known him many many years. Of course, I trained at the same boxing gym as he, and uh, Penny's Boxing Devonport Boxing Club had probably the best amateur boxing team in the country at the time. Um, I donated blood down there for three years straight before I could even start hanging with a lot of these guys. <laughs> and uh, I got my ass kicked. Um, but uh, so Michael was untouchable. Even the best in the world couldn't touch him. Um, he did lose to James Tony. I lost his title to James Tony when he uh, 
he didn't even train for that fight, and he was toying with James Tony the entire fight. He was so gifted, it was ridiculous. Uh, but he, he didn't even train for that fight, and he said he even he partied a lot uh, leading up to that fight and gassed out, you know, toward toward the very end of the fight and got clipped and got put away. So um, he was that good. He, he was really that good. He's he's very tall, rangy, lanky, great movements, hand speeds ridiculous. So he was going to let me kick, so I can I can kick his left leg off into the crowd, hopefully, and have some fun. Where is this supposed to take place right now? Uh, it's supposed to be in a big arena across the river, uh, unfortunately, in Illinois, which is locked down. And Pritzker, uh, the, the governor over there, is a, a very hard left-leaning, big government um, uh, guy. So, you know, we may have to move it back over, over the river to Iowa uh, to try and get that pulled off. But um, either way, you know, it remains to be seen. I'm very busy with my podcast. Um, our, our sponsors have been helping us a great deal. And uh, a lot of people are ordering their products. Um, and, and so we're doing okay. You know, that's the main thing is that I need to be able to make a living. Everybody needs to be able to make a living. And the fact that our governments are telling private citizens that they, they can't turn the lights on in their own businesses and pay their own bills. That's insane. That's, this is unprecedented in history. The attempt at complete uh, control by our government right now, uh, it's going to cause a civil war here. If, if, uh, if they continue with it, I can tell you right now that and I'm not saying that based on my personal thoughts. I'm saying that based on my discussions with a lot of former special forces tier one operators who are who are saying, look, man, this is this is getting real serious. We fought to defend the, the, the constitution of this of this nation being shit on by our politicians and by by globalists right now. So they're they're asking for it. They're asking for it. And these are some scary individuals who will who will do work if necessary, and I'll, I'll carry their water, bro. I'll carry their water for them. Their, their water and ammo. I got it. So would this fight coming up in June be your first major fight since you retired from MMA? Well, I technically, I technically never retired. I mean, after I beat Thomas Denny, I just kind of walked away and focused on coaching and doing broadcasting, of course. Um, so, yeah, but it'll be the first one, you know, that, that I've done that I've – I really, um, I, you know, I, it's not the fight that I'm excited about. It's the competition uh, and the person that I'm competing against uh, because he's he's got a huge name in the boxing world that, it, you know, it's a crossover. It's a great crossover opportunity for MMA and for boxing and for a lot of young fighters from the Illinois, Iowa, Quad Cities. There's a lot of tough people in this area. Um very skilled fighters who just haven't had a chance and haven't been on a bigger bigger platform. So it's going to serve that that purpose. Plus, I'm launching a internet pay per view service. So you know that that would be the major launch of it. We've already done one event that went actually pretty well, but uh, this would be the first major one that we've that we've done. So that's it's kind of a, a lot lot going on with it. But I'm excited, you know, just just to make it happen. What's the internet pay per view service called? Well, we haven't even we haven't even got that. Um, we launched it with with one company that could that could provide it. We uh, used uh, a, a production company that you know does all the camera work and, and the sound and everything else. I did the commentary, of course. Uh, Justin Holstein, who's put a lot of shows on on television, um, was the producer. Jeff um, Jeffrey Wilson, my co-host on on my podcast, The Conspiracy Farm, was my was my co-host for the uh, for the fights. And all those, I just did it. I literally did it in, from the time, uh, and I'll tell you why it happened. Access TV suddenly out of the blue discontinued. They sold out to Anthem, a Canadian uh, production company, and then let everybody go at once. Everybody from the department, from the sports department, basically was gone. And uh, I, was, I was pretty angry about it because they didn't even give us a heads up. You know, hey, uh, start looking for a job. You know, we're going to probably you – no know, uh, – and of course, I get it. Business is business. But then you've got 40 some families who don't, you know, the dads don't have a job, moms don't have a job all of a sudden. Uh, it's, it's a cutthroat thing to do in my mind. So um, I was a little, little angry about it. And after I licked my wounds for a few days, I went, I wonder if we can do this ourselves. So I just started calling my friends uh, here in town, not even outside of town. Uh, there's enough talented people here. So we just put it together. It took us 17 days to put it all together and just put the pieces together and, and do a show, a live MMA broadcast. So 
Um, it doesn't take rocket scientists, although these guys are very talented uh, at what they do on the technical side of things. Uh, we pulled it off in 17 days, and I went, you know what? Um, yeah, we can do this. We, we can absolutely do this. Now, of course, you were the first UFC welterweight champion. You started in MMA back when it was really no holds barred and there was events being canceled. It was a different landscape. Uh, what was your path to get into the sport originally? Uh, I had, <clears throat> of course, grown up in Iowa, Bettendorf, Iowa, which was a hotbed for wrestling, even in you know Iowa standards. Um, many state champions and state placers and state championship teams and you know always ranked in the top three in the state you know my entire childhood all the way to the time i was in high school um so you know for me it, it it's something that's in my blood obviously since the time i was five i was wrestling so um went to college mom got sick with heart problems older siblings all had you know uh, families living in different places couldn't take care of her so i quit school Went home, took care of her, was pouring concrete during the day and um, bartending and bouncing at night in different clubs. And then uh, one day, pouring concrete, one of my foremen, uh, a guy originally from down south, had a, had a southern accent. Uh, he was a black belt in karate. And he said, you know, in his southern twang, he said, uh, boy, karate man, karate man whip a wrestler any day. And I went, well, well how about this? Lunchtime? But you and I walk out in that field and find out. And he goes, it's on. You know, he was a crazy country boy with a black belt in karate. So we walked out in the field. I double-legged him, slammed him on his head, and slapped him around. And he went, holy shit. Okay, I'm a believer. <laughs> so he gave me a free week pass to a kickboxing and karate gym in Davenport, Iowa. So that's how I started training in, in martial arts side of things. Um even with my boxing background, I found it, I found the kicking part, the knees, the elbows, all that sort of stuff, uh, very intriguing. Got a black belt in traditional Shorei karate, won a uh, United States title in in K1 rules kickboxing, and then the uh, then the UFC came out, and I obviously had a wrestling background, boxing, the traditional martial arts, the kickboxing, so a lot of the components, some judo, uh, understood arm bars and chokes, but not you know to the level that I needed to, and uh, so I went, holy cow. My sport just got invented. This is incredible. So I started training, uh, gosh, with, with uh, I found Sergio Montiero, who was in the United States to get his master's degree. He started teaching me. And when he was teaching me, he said, don't tell anybody, don't tell the Brazilians where you're learning this stuff because the, we're not supposed to teach Americans this. So he taught me jujitsu strictly for fighting. No gi, strictly for fighting. Uh, taught me a lot, man, a lot. And... Uh, then I got into uh, the Battle of the Masters. I had to pay bills, man. My mom was sick. She couldn't work. Uh, I was trying to take care of pay for a house at 20 years old and um, car payments and everything else. So it was it was time to get after it and make money in, in chunks. So you you went 15 and 0, I guess, to start your MMA career off. What were some of your keys to success there? Um, you know... I was in I was in a pretty desperate situation to be honest with you. I felt that you know I, that I was destined for something bigger than you know um, just doing manual labor and stuff, man. I, I you know I really had bigger dreams and um, and I, I can tell you that um, I learned a lot about myself pouring concrete, pretending, bouncing, and training for fights at the same time. Um, and you know, so so for me, it, it's uh, it, it kind of um, it solidified the, the passion um, every day that I got up to pour concrete. That's a tough job, man. Pouring concrete is not easy. And, I mean, I got incredibly strong from doing it, throwing around steel forms and throwing jackhammers and 15, 18-pound mall hammers and stuff like they were nothing. And uh, But I realized every morning that I opened my eyes, the minute I opened my eyes, I said one word. What, guess what that word was when I opened my eyes? How can I get out of this? I'm one, not word. Sure. one word was, all I'd say when I opened my eyes, knowing that I'm going to pour concrete all day, was, um, sorry if I cuss. I, can, I don't know if I can cuss on this. but So um, that drove me. It drove a lot of passion. It drove, uh, you know, and my mother, 
was a fighter through and through, man. She never uh, showed any negativity in life, uh, no matter how many hardships she had been through. And uh, that taught me a lot about just being tough and being a fighter in life. And uh, so, you know, for me, it was, I'm, uh, I'm going all the way with this. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not doing this half-ass. I'm, I'm, and so I just completely dedicated my life. I got rid of all the friends that were a bad influence on my life. Um, ignored everything. If you didn't serve a purpose in my life for the goals that I had, um, I just didn't. I just didn't spend any time with you. You know, um, and that's just the way. That's just the way I lived my life. Then, when you joined the UFC, was that a big deal to you? Uh, competing in that sixteen-man tournament. Um, the the um, when I got the call finally to go into the UFC because I was ready to go in before there were any weight divisions. I'm like, let's do this. Because I'd already fought two uh, tournaments with no weight divisions, no rules, no time limits, all that stuff. And everybody was, I mean, everybody besides maybe one guy was all, you know, 210 and up, uh, a lot bigger than me. So I was ready to go in whenever. Um, but the weight divisions got created, the 170-pound class got created, and John Peretti was the one that, that put all that together. And uh, called my manager and said, he's in. So, you know, that was, yeah, it was a big deal, man. And, and winning that, winning that tournament, um, you know, it was a, a realization of, of a lot of, a lot of years of hard work. Man. What was the money like in those days compared to now? I think the most I made from a fight, which was a, a fight in Japan was probably 80 grand. Wow. And then you had to pay your trainers out of that and everything, I assume. Yeah, trainer, manager, uh, all that stuff. But that was my own trainer, really. You know what I mean? That was my own coach. So, um, I mean, I, I learned the components from, you know, a stadium champion from Thailand who lived in Illinois, uh, had immigrated here. I learned from a Brazilian, Sergio Monteiro. I learned, you know, boxing from downtown Davenport from Alvino Pena, a legendary coach, and grew up wrestling in the state of Iowa. So, you know, I had the components. Um, I sought out the people that I had to, the, you know, I, if I needed to travel to learn what I needed to learn. And then I just bring that knowledge back and we just trained like wrestlers, man. We trained like madmen in a wrestling room and, you know, put on boxing gloves. And luckily I'd had, you know, a lot of great guys to spar with in boxing and kickboxing and um, just everything kind of fell into place, you know? And you won the UFC welterweight title from Mikey uh, or Mickey Burnett in Brazil. What was that experience like for you? Um, it kind of, it was kind of, I, well, I guess I was kind of considered the 170 pound champion already for winning the tournament. Um, so it was kind of like a title defense because Mikey dropped out of the tournament after his first round fight with uh, Eugenio Tadio from Brazil, which was a war. Um, he said he dropped out due to exhaustion, but, uh, or a broken hand, but he was tired. So, um, and he was tough, tough, tough guy, very tough guy, very strong. Um, but, uh, it was a very weird fight, the whole thing. I went into it with the wrong strategy completely, and it was a very boring fight. Um, and I changed a lot. Once I went into the UFC, and they flat out told us, if you lose, we can get rid of you. And so I just went in saying to myself, if they do something stupid and give me a finish, I'll, I'll just take it. But I just need to make sure where I'm at on the scorecards at any given time, uh, paid attention to strategy for the most part. And just made sure that, that on the scorecards, I was up. And if I could get a knockout on somebody, I'd knock them out. If I could submit them, I would. Um, but I was I was there to win and get paid, man. Uh, I was there to get the W, uh, no matter what, because I had, you know, I had I had house payments and stuff, you know. And I was I was fighting I was fighting to win. Uh, I was passionate about it, but I was also monetarily it was very important for me. And I interviewed Carlos Newton, and he discussed his fight with you where he managed to take the title. He said he was nervous to going, going into it. He had to do a lot of breathing exercises to remain calm. Uh, any thoughts on that fight? I tell you what, man, it was, that was the funnest fight I probably had in my career. Even though I lost the title in that fight, um, Carlos was an exceptional athlete, man. So gifted, so fast, so agile, very smart. Um, you know, he was, he was a truly gifted guy. Um, you know, he was, I think athletically, even though, I mean, at that time in my life, I mean, I could dunk a basket. I'm five ten. I could dunk a basketball. I could bench three sixty five. Uh, I could run a four four forty. I mean, I was I was a good athlete, but he was he was a ridiculous athlete, and uh, you know he was smart. I mean, I had him. I, I felt I had him beat, 
when uh, he had gotten a takedown on me and I was up against the cage laying on my back and uh, he he was hitting me trying to hit me um, and his punches were so soft and his breathing was really hard and I went man all I gotta get all I, all I have to do at this point is get up and knock his ass out he's going to sleep um, I knew he could take my power if I landed a combo on him so I decided to get up and as I got up, I got lazy. I was overconfident. I took my underhook out on him, and he spun to my back. And as he spun one way, I tried to spin out the other way and, and come out and square up with him. And he caught me in a cow catcher. And when we went down to the ground, once he caught that, when we went down to the ground, he was really smart. And he lodged his shoulder in against the cage and one of the support beams of the cage. So when I reached up to grab his trap muscle and roll him backwards onto his back, his, he was wedged in against the cage. So that I couldn't move him and I was like oh man what a bad situation to be in so look man hats off to him it was a very smart fight uh, by him and uh, he took advantage of, of that one mistake I made and won the fight and won the title and you jumped up to middleweight shortly after that I think you had one victory in between was that because Matt Hughes was in the welterweight weight class and you didn't want to go against a teammate uh, the UFC forced me out of the weight division, actually. They told me that if I didn't move up to 185, I no longer had a job. And I said, wait a minute, you guys gave me a guaranteed um, rematch clause in my contract that said if I want to fight, that I was fighting Carlos or whoever had the title next. So they made that fight, and then later that day they called me and said, wait a minute, we can't do that fight with you and Carlos because Pedro Hizo and Randy Couture are doing a rematch on the same card, and that was the same co-main event as what happened in New Jersey when I lost the title. So they said, we'll give you a choice. You can either have Matt Hughes uh, fight Newton for the title, or we get to pick somebody from a different camp. And then, um, you know, obviously, no matter who wins, if, if it's not Matt that's in, no matter who wins, uh, you'll, you'll get the winner of that of that match. So I'd already promised Matt that I'd make him a champ. I, I had the title for almost four years with the tournament title and, and the other stuff involved. So I said, you know what? I'll focus on coaching. I'll fight a little bit, uh, maybe. But I asked the UFC if I could just be the gatekeeper at 170. Didn't even care. I'd, I'd lived my glory, had my fun, time to help the other guys. And uh, they said, no, you've got you, you and Jason Black, uh, Rob Lawler, and Matt Hughes, all from your camp at 170. Um, you've basically trained yourself out of a position, is what you've done. So... Um, they forced me to go up to 185. I didn't even want to be there. When I got in the cage, I was pretty much dis I was disheartened by the whole process. You know, the harshness of the business side of it. Um, at that time, you know, in my life, it was basically four time four year uh, UFC champion, and you're you're basically as discardable as a as a piece of trash. Um, made me made me realize the business side was was pretty harsh. Now, how is Matt Hughes doing these days? I think he's doing pretty good. You know, he's, he's still got a little bit of speech stuff um, that he's working on and um, still a little bit of a limp with his left leg. But for the most part, you know, he's mad. He's, you know, he's got that same sense of humor and, and uh, he's, he's, he's all there for the most part, um, as far as I can tell, any conversations I've ever had with him. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, from the severity of the brain injury that he had, that he deals with some stuff internally probably you know and, and uh, some hardship that, that he deals with you know in his own head and he's never expressed that but I'm, I'm, I'm certain that he's probably you know there's a lot of fighters out there and guys that uh, guys who have been blown up in war who deal with you know some of that stuff maybe not to the severity but certainly the guys that have been blown up have dealt with that severity of, of brain shear the shearing and the brain tissue and everything else so um, it can't be easy to deal with man but he's he's doing pretty damn good as far as I'm concerned what were some of your coaching methodologies that contributed to your success as a coach? Um, well, I mean, to be a good coach, the way I looked at it was, um, you know, one, make practice way harder than any fight ever could be. Uh, the, the conditioning um, had, to be, had to be there. The, the mental toughness had to be there. Um, I had to read people individually. You know, some people were visual learners some were verbal more verbal um some people needed a hug some people needed a pat on the back some people needed to be yelled at um some people needed their asses kicked once in a while to wake up you know 
Um, so it just, just being able to read people, I think it taught me how to read people pretty well and know when to, know when to back off, know when to push and when not to push and, uh, you know, get the most out of people, you know, and push people to their limits in practice. And when they've been pushed to their limits, you know, pull back and say, all right, let's not get anybody hurt. Uh, once people got fatigued, got sloppy doing, say, takedowns, for instance. All right, let's just go to the ground, get in, get, in, get in the guard, let's work these drills, let's do this, you know, live grappling on the ground, you know, takedowns so we don't get any knee or shoulder injuries, things like that, you know. And my, my whole idea was, you know, I'll get to their fights um, in one piece, in, in great shape with, uh, you know, the strategy going, you know, so that's that was something that, that was important. But also, I made sure to weed out people that didn't belong. Um, there were a lot of... I got a lot of criticism back in those days that uh, I was too harsh. I was mean. I was uh, an asshole. Uh, things like that. But you know, I'm a guy that came from wrestling in the state of Iowa, and you know it's very intense. If you're going to wrestle in the state of Iowa at any at a high level, you're you're going to have to be very intense. You're going to have to be an unforgiving, selfish human being um, because you're stepping on other people's dreams to realize your own. Um, so, you know, that was, that was the mentality and that was kind of an exclamation point was put on my mentality when I was invited to be a special guest at a kickboxing event in Chicago and a kid died in front of me. I was in giving him CPR trying to save his life and he died in my hand. So, um, I never had, I never wanted to go back to somebody's parents or somebody's wife, uh, family and say, you know, your, your brother or your son, your husband. Um, got hurt or died because I didn't train correctly and push him hard enough. So I, I deliberately made it. You know, I mean, I would come in on certain nights and say, um, you know, time to time to weed out the people that don't belong. This is a night when it's going to get ugly, and people would quit. From fighters that would come from around the world, show up on a Sunday, sleep at the hotel, show up Monday, train Tuesday, train, and after Wednesday's training, they were going home. They were supposed to be there for six weeks, eight weeks, and. You know, like this isn't for me, man. This is this is this is insane. So that's how I did it. That's how that's and the people that stuck around got really good and uh, were very resilient, very tough uh, mentally and physically. And that's that's you know that's how you get a snowball going. You make you, know, you make monsters that way. I think it's been about five years since I read your book, but I seem to recall Brock Lesnar was one of the fighters that came to train for a week or so and it wasn't for him there? Um, well, I think Brock was certainly tough enough. Uh, he got injured training. He tore a muscle. I think he tore a bicep tendon or something um, during training. But, um, you know, his athleticism, his strength, um, all of that was was certainly up to par, of course. I mean, he was a world-class athlete. He was a monster. Um, but he didn't like... He didn't. I don't think he liked sparring with all my heavyweights. I had a lot of good heavyweights back then, with you know Tim Sylvia, Ben Rothwell, Brad Imes, uh, and several others. You know who were um, they were they were having fun teeing off on, on sparring night. I can tell you. <laughs> How heavy would you guys go in sparring typically on a typical week? Um, on Wednesday nights, we were at one hundred percent. Warm up a round or two, and then it was you know sixteen ounce gloves, headgear shin pads um and there was no maliciousness it wasn't um especially for the high level guys who were training with each other you know if i caught somebody with a right hand and, and i wobbled him or something i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try and finish him i'm gonna back off and work the body and let him recover and, and not go crazy the rest of the time and, and we're not there to knock each other out um but uh but there were plenty of knockouts i mean people that just had shitty defense who were guys from other camps or whatever who uh, weren't used to that pace, and the, they weren't used to the you know forty guys in one room being ranked in the top ten in the world in their weight divisions. Um, you know they were big fish in little ponds who would come there. They were the best guy out of their gym, or one of the best guys out of their gym. So they never really got pushed. But in our room, you know, with the, with the thermostat turned up to ninety five degrees, and every guy that they grabbed was ranked in the top ten in the world. You're in a legitimate um, alley fight. Um, every five minute go you have with every guy you go with and uh, they it would melt under that that pressure i see is it true you trained the undertaker a little bit or is that just a rumor 
I did not train the Undertaker, although he came to our locker room when Tim was fighting, defending his title once. Um, he came and hung out with us in our locker room. Very cool guy, man. I, I really uh, enjoyed having him around in the in the locker room and stuff. I, I I've always uh, really enjoyed him. Um, you know what what great theatrical skill and athleticism and everything you know that goes into pro wrestling. He's one of the biggest names ever, and um, yeah. So him just taking the time to hang out with us was really cool. And Matthew Granahan wanted me to ask you about your famous single leg slam and. What's your secret on that one? <laughs> My single leg slam. Um, well, I I was taught as far as I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, which single leg slam. But I was taught one by an Iranian Olympian. Um, that's uh, you probably know. You remember Shem uh, Kamal Shalarus? Yeah. Um, Kamal has the greatest single leg takedown dump in the history of mankind. That dude. He's, he's such a good wrestler. He was so fun to be around um, and work out with. But his timing on that, and he taught me how to do that. And uh, uh, that one, that one's, I mean, you can send somebody into orbit with that one. Now, I got Tank Abbott's version of the incident with Lee Murray. Could you tell us your version of it? Oh, yeah. Tito Ortiz, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, Tito. <laughs> Tito was on my one of my podcasts, um, not the Conspiracy Farm, but uh, uh, one of my one of my other podcasts that I used to do. And at the end of it, you know, I basically spelled it out how it all went down, and and uh, he he you know he he, he really didn't argue with me um, on air when we were recording. Um, his his account is obviously pretty flawed because he got KO'd by Lee Murray, um, so. You know, I'll just tell you that. But, you know, one of one of Tito's good buddies, and I was friends with Tito at the time, so I had no reason to lie. Um, I wasn't going to tell any lies about it. But Bo, his buddy, uh, real nice guy, I felt horrible for him, uh, came out. We, we came out of the nightclub in London, and uh, Bo jumped on my back, and he put me in a rear choke. But he wasn't choking me. I knew he wasn't serious, and I kind of almost knew it was him just because I'd been hanging out with him all night and joking around and stuff. So one of my fighters, Tony Fricklin, thought that Bo was actually choking me. So Tony ripped him off my back, and I could tell he got ripped off my back by the way I got tugged backwards. Uh, and then right away I turned around, and there's Tony and Bo face to face like this in front of me. And Tony's going, "What do you? What, what the f are you doing trying to choke my coach?" And right when uh, Bo wanted to say something back to him, uh, Paul Lee Murray's buddy. Paul was the one that was part one of the guys in, in part of the so-called biggest bank heist in, in world history. Um, Paul out of nowhere, who's a big dude, um, with a running start, blasted Bo with a right hand and launched him. Uh, and the alley blew up into a huge fight. Um, so I'm standing there going, holy shit, I can't believe this is all happening. Uh, all out of a total misunderstanding. Um, so Tony wasn't, Tony hadn't hit anybody and didn't hit anybody. I wasn't hitting anybody, but I watched Tito come running from my left, and he was doing this and ripping his jacket off, his leather coat off. And as as he was running forward, I looked to my right, and there's Tito or uh, Lee Murray backing up, doing the same thing, taking his coat off. As soon as their coats hit the ground, uh, Tito threw a combo at at Lee. Lee ducked out of the way of everything. I don't even think Lee was was drinking that night, so it was an unfair fight to begin with because Tito was hammered like I was. But um, uh, Lee got out of the way of all the punches, threw a five-punch combo back at Tito. Every punch landed. Um, very hard punches. And Tito went down, uh, landed on his face unconscious. And Lee started to punt him in the head with his steel-toed boots on. And now I'm friends with Tito at the time. And I also train Lee Murray, so I'm friends with him. So I don't want to see this. Um, the fight's already done with, essentially. And I grab Lee and I say, stop, dude. Get out of here. So he goes, all right, Pat. See you later. And he takes off. Uh, so him and his boys leave, and uh, the uh, like, I don't know, 25, 30 British cops show up in the alley, all the bobbies with their tall, you know, cop hats on, and they've got literally, some of them have fire extinguisher sized OC canisters. They're going to spray the entire alley down with pepper spray, and I say, who's in charge here? Um, and one of them says, I am, and I go, maybe you don't understand alley. 
full of professional fighters. But if you start spraying them with, with pepper spray, you're going to have some serious problems on your hands. You're going to piss off some really scary people. And he goes, all right, you're in charge of clearing out the alley then. So I started telling everybody, get back to the hotel, get back to the hotel. And we got everybody out of there without getting everybody OC uh, pepper sprayed and everything else. Um, but what ended up happening out of the thing is, is um, you know, Dana White calls me, starts yelling at me, you know, what the, what the F? You guys jumped Tito with your British buddies and all this other stuff. You guys beat him up. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't, I didn't punch anybody. I didn't do anything. Uh, Tony didn't do anything. Um, Tito got knocked out fair and square. Uh, he went after Lee. Uh, Lee knocked his ass out and kicked him in the head a couple times. And I, I saved Tito's ass by uh, telling Lee to stop. So I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, you know, well, I'm going to get the surveillance tape of that alley. And... Uh, and then we're going to find out what happened. And then I said, good, make a copy for me because <laughs> I'm not lying. And, uh, you know, nothing ever happened to that besides uh, nothing ever came of it. The, the tape never made it anywhere on YouTube or anything like that, obviously, um, probably because I was telling the truth. Um, and also at the same time, you know, the thing that pissed me off is, is Tito's lies caused a massive division between Dana White and I. It cost me a lot of money. Um, it cost me a, a good relationship with, with, with Dana and kind of started a, a, a war for me uh, because, you know, one of my fighters lost his contract, uh, Tony Fricklin, lost his UFC contract because Tito lied about that whole thing. And, uh, you know, it really, it really uh, it, it was very bothersome. So, um, you know, I forgive Tito for that. Um, I think that the truth has come out. I think enough people that were there. Chuck Liddell will tell you exactly the same story. Uh, he was there knocking people out left and right, trying to save his own ass because he had people coming after him. So, um, anyway, that's that's how it went down. And you know, Tito can say anything he wants to the contrary, but um, I watched I watched it all happen. Yeah, Tito. When I asked him, he told me he didn't really want to talk about it because of the people involved were some serious people, and and Tank had given me a version of it that some people said was questionable. So it's good to have your version on tape now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, tank and I tank, tank, tank discounts what happened between he and I, and I think it was Biloxi, Mississippi. I'm trying to remember the city, uh, exactly me chasing him, me, me chasing him down the street in Biloxi, Mississippi. <laughs> so what was the story with that? Um, you know, Tito was always, I mean, uh, uh, Tank was always a bully, you know, Tank was always a bully and, and, uh, he was out on the dance floor, uh, dancing, had his shirt off and stuff and, um, grabbing on the ladies and you know, doing what he wanted. And so I went out on the dance floor and I acted like I was dancing and I deliberately kept running, kind of backing up into him and smashing into him and stuff. Right. Just to piss him off. And uh, I, was, I was raised Henri. That's just the way I am, right? I'm a wrestler. So anyway, uh, later on, Bob Marowitz, who was the owner of, of the UFC at the time, Semaphore Entertainment, was standing. Uh, there was a bar rail, just a railing with a place where you could put your drinks between the dance floor and the bar. And Tank was standing there on the other side of the bar rail and talking to, talking to Bob Marowitz. And I walked up and shook Bob's hand and looked at Tank. I said, good, good fight tonight, Tank. And he had just knocked out, I think, uh, Nelmark or somebody, I can't remember who the hell he knocked out. Um, but he put his hand on my face, palm my face, and shoved me away and goes, Get out of my face. And I just immediately I went, You're done, you fat bastard. I'm gonna kick the shit out of you. So he started walking down that railing, and I started walking down that railing on both sides of it. And I thought once we got to the end of it, we were just gonna meet at the end and start going, start throwing. And uh, the door was to his right, so when I got to the end of that railing, and started to round the corner, he turned and went out the door with uh, him and a couple of his buddies. Um, so I had uh, Jeremy Horn and Omri Batesh with me, uh, Brazilian fighter Omri. And uh, so I started yelling at Tank and, uh, and uh, basically ended up, they, they got a pretty good head start jogging down the street. I was running after him and by the time I got to the hotel, which was, I don't know, three blocks away, whatever it was, I uh, got into the lobby, and I saw Jerry Bolander from uh, from the Lions Den. And I said, Jerry, I go, did you see Tank? And he goes, yeah. He went up the stairs to the elevator. And uh, 
so I went up the stairs and, and Tank was gone. But uh, so Tank Tank's, uh, <laughs> Tank doesn't Tank doesn't see it that way. Um, uh, but which is fine. I don't you know I don't care. He's he's way past his prime more than I am, so it's no big deal. Now you fought Dan Severin, and he was much bigger than you. You talked earlier. You would fight in the no weight class shows. Um, you put in a really good performance in that fight. Uh, what were some of the keys to uh, doing well there? Man, just avoiding the knees on the ground and that sort of stuff. You know, he's so big and so strong and um, carrying his weight. I, I, don't, I can't remember if that was a 20 or 30 minute one round fight. And it was basically if nobody finished the other, it would be declared a draw. Had they gone on points, um, he would have won. He was on top of me for the majority of the fight. Um, but, uh, but you know, I got out of there, you know, didn't have any real damage or anything like that. And uh, he was ungodly strong. Uh, ridiculously powerful guy and so um, I considered it you know kind of a moral victory weighing 180 pounds at the time a guy that's probably 270 275 and as strong as he was um, you know it was I was I was a little nervous going into that one I can tell you what were some of the keys you used to combat nervousness in a fight like that just for any fighters watching um, you know what? The, the nervousness um, for me always left once the fight started, of course. Um, there were times, though, where I was crushed up against the cage um, with with him on top of me where it was like, you know, you get claustrophobic real quick when you're getting crushed like a like a sardine uh, by somebody that big and powerful. So, um, you know, I actually had a moment during that fight. There was a guy, uh, Eddie Langford, who played football at the University of Iowa. He started a, a, the college my dad was coaching at. And... Uh, we were friends with their family my entire life, the, the Langford family. And Ed had been drinking a lot, and he had somehow worked his way right up next to the cage with his face up against the cage. My head's crushed against the cage. And so his mouth is like two inches from my ear, and he keeps saying, um, and my dad was deceased long before that, um, saying, do it for your dad, Millie, do it for your dad, Millie. And he kept saying that over and over and over. And finally I looked at him and I go, Eddie? Go fucking sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and he went and sat down. But, you know, you can still find moments of, of stuff like that in, in really tough fights, you know, where you're you're still having a good time and plenty coherent of the world around you, you know. So it was uh, it, it was a good time. But I, I credit, you know, a lot of great training partners, uh, skills on, on the ground as far as defensive to not get my head caved in, you know, for that. Now, back in about 2016, you challenged the winner of the Shamrock versus Gracie fight. I don't know if that fight actually happened or not, but was there ever any talk of you seriously fighting Shamrock? Um, no, man. Those guys didn't want to fight me. I mean, Hoist doesn't want to fight me. Hoist knows he can't take me down and he can't outbox me and stuff. So that's never that would never happen. And, and Ken, um, I think, was just you know there to fight Hoist. Hoist has a big name, of course. And uh, for whatever reason, it, it uh, didn't, didn't. I think it did come off, actually. Hoist beat him, didn't he? I've Hoist never heard Shamrock beating Hoist, so. Or, 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 I think it happened. Yeah, so I th I'm trying to remember, you know, it was one of those, I think it was a Strike Force show, wasn't it? Or, uh, or Actually, uh, that may have been the one, you're right, because Shamrock lost, then he failed the test, and he was supposed to fight Severin after that. But the Severn fight was canceled because okay. of his drug test failure. So you are right. It did happen. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, yeah. But, you know, uh, it would have been fun to fight Hoist, but, yeah, it wasn't wasn't meant to be. I see. What are, what are your feelings on John Jones' uh, situation, as great a fighter as he is? He keeps seeming to get in trouble here and there. Um. You know, the, the self-destructive mode that he's been in for years, it's sad, actually, you know. And um, unfortunately, that self-destructive mode can end up taking somebody else's life, you know. If he gets in a wreck and, and kills somebody or, you know, goofing around shooting guns or whatever, man, that's, uh, you know, it's not a good, that's not a good situation. So I, I hope that he can, um, you know, deal with his, his inner demons, whatever they are, whatever's driving him to to drink and do drugs and stuff the way he is. I hope that he can, you know, um, confront those because that's a process, you know, it's like, uh, you know, people, people don't drink and, and become drunks 
or drug addicts because there's a sale on Bush Light at the store. Um, you know, that's the thing that people don't realize. It's it's not about you know people who who don't understand that sort of stuff say, well, just don't take a drink. You know, uh, it's it's that it's, they don't they don't have an alcoholic mind, so they don't understand. Um, you know, that many times, for the most part, from my understanding, is that alcoholism and drug addiction comes from people who lead lives with a lot of emotion instead of, of just pure analytical thought. There, there are different types of people on this planet. Some people just go through life with less feelings and more more analytical thought and, and others that use more feelings and emotions to guide their, to guide their lives. And many times the people um, that, that guide their lives based on emotions can become affected by you know, tragedies more, um, by, by how people treat them. Uh, they're affected by words much, much more, much deeper. So that's that's something that that John needs to address, and and hopefully he can do that because you know he's a, he's a supremely talented uh, young man, and uh, I, I hope that he can get that figured out so that so that he doesn't destroy his own life or somebody else's in the process. He did tell the police that he has memory issues from being hit in the head so much. It's unclear whether that was an excuse or not, but if he is suffering memory issues, do you think he should consider maybe hanging it up even though he is at the top of his game? Um, well, I mean, I had to go back and make excuses for the beginning of all of this stuff when he started getting in trouble, right? Um, you know, so I, I, I don't remember at that point when he first started getting in trouble, um, him taking a whole lot of abuse in fights. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. You know, we've all taken a lot of abuse. We all have, especially guys who are veterans of, of a lot of fights, a lot of tough fights at a high level, even, um, uh, you know, that probably have some CTE issues and things like that. I know I'm not the guy I was when I went into the sport. I know that, um, and it might come with age too, but, you know, I was a guy who really paid attention to defense. Um, I, being around old boxers and old kickboxers, I noticed that some of them, uh, would lose their train of thought real easily. Um, they talked like their tongue was too big for their mouth, things like that. And I, I said to myself early on, I don't want to be that guy. So I paid attention to watching films on on Sugar Ray Robinson, on Willie Pep, you know, the old boxers with incredible defensive skills, the Roy Joneses, the Mayweathers, you know, all those types of fighters uh, who had such incredible defensive skills. And look, call it luck or whatever, but in spine and kickboxing, boxing, MMA, Compet uh, live live fights. Um, I, I never got a concussion. I never got knocked out. Never got a concussion. Never was nauseous. Um, I've had a uh, headache one time in my life, and that was when I almost died from spinal meningitis. But that's the only headaches I've ever had. I don't I don't even get headaches, so I don't even know what they are. So um, you know, knock on wood. But I never got hit with something that I didn't see coming, and I think that was the key. Uh, it's the guys that get hit with stuff. That they didn't see common that go to sleep. Now, I don't really remember what this was all about, but I had a fan that wanted me to ask you about the fallout of the Ultimate Fighter situation with you. Oh, uh, when I was supposed to coach? Yes. Yeah, well, um, after there was some, you know, Dana and I had our differences for many years, and um, I was on the movie set down in Mexico, a Paul Walker film called Bobby Z, and my friend, a good friend, was the director, John Hirschfeld. And um, John Hirschfeld got a phone call from Dana White. He was friends with Dana White, and uh, Dana White called him, and, and John Hirschfeld, the director, said, "Here, here's my phone. Somebody wants to talk to you." So I grabbed John's phone, and it was Dana. And he said, "Hey, man," he goes, "I just, I got a question for you." He goes, "I want to, I want to bury the hatchet with you," and uh, you know water under the bridge between us whatever if if i named you or asked you to be a coach in the ultimate fighter show would you consider it and i said but why me you know why, why would you pick me you know we've had so many differences over the years and he said i just want this to be done with and i said yeah all right i appreciate that thank you very much yeah i'll do it so it was going to be carlos newton and i coaching well the to, the way it all went down made it way worse than it could have been because um, I called my wife and my wife was excited. She's like, "Oh my God! Finally, you guys are bringing the hatchet. You're going to be the coach on the reality show. That's awesome. Good, you know, really good stuff. Things are looking up for us, you know." Um, so the director 
Um, we rented a golf course clubhouse that night to watch Matthews fight Joe Riggs. Um, so it was me, Robbie Lawler, Tim Sylvia, the director, the Carradine brothers, Lawrence Fishburne, Paul Walker, you know, tons of uh, movie stars were there, big wig producers, my director friend, some of my camp, you know, fighters. Chuck Liddell was in that film. He was there. And the director had said, Dana's going to announce tonight that Pat and Carlos Newton are the are the guys that are coaching the, the Ultimate Fighter. And so everybody's excited, right? And I'm excited, of course. And, well, Dana gets in the cage, and he says, I just wanted to announce uh, the fighters for uh, this coming season's uh, Ultimate Fighter. And all of a sudden, he brought uh, Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz into the cage. And I went, you dirty son of a bitch. And uh, so when I got back from the movie – uh, set. Uh, we were down there five weeks total. I think I was three or four weeks into it. But when I got back home, I got on the phone and I called his assistant at the time, Dana, uh, Donna. And I said, hey, I go, tell your boss if he's got any balls to call me back. And so he called me back and he goes, what do you mean if I got any balls? And I go, dude, do you realize what you just did to me? Like, you have no comprehension of what you just did to me. You double crossed the shit out of me again. And, uh, you know, he basically at that time told me to fuck off um so you know that fueled my fire again now i'm pissed off again at him um so it, it didn't make things any better um and uh you know it was it was unfortunate that it went down that way but uh you know he had apologized publicly for it you know before they put me in the in the ultimate or in the uh, uh hall of fame and all that sort of stuff so you know what man it, it is what it is it's water under the bridge and um, it was unfortunate that it all had to go down the way it did. Um, there were some things I just didn't have control. I had control on how I reacted to it. I should have said, I get it, whatever. Those guys are going to sell more tickets. Um, that's fine, you know, and just lick my wounds and, and just been, been cool about it. But instead, look, man, I got bullied my whole life as a little kid. I got a real problem with, with, with people with power, you know, doing things like that. I, I've learned over time and age not to let those things bother me, but, you know, I was the kind of guy that if a guy six foot eight uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, was was picking on me, I'm going to try and fight him because <laughs> I just don't I just don't take shit from people, you know. And that's <clears throat> you know that's a good quality and a bad quality. That's a double edged knife, right? And last couple of questions here. Uh, this one might have to do a little bit with conspiracies, but what is your opinion on uh, unidentified flying objects? Uh, well, for I mean, for anybody to think that there isn't, you know, intelligent life somewhere else or here already um, is fooling themselves. I mean, it's it's just there's been too many things, and whether it's you know um, reverse engineered stuff that we have made off off you know the the Roswell crash, whatever. Um, but but to think that you know you know anybody that doubt that um are you familiar with the emerald tablets no the sumerian kings list no not yet maybe i should be subscribing okay, so, to your podcast so what what people need to do is they need to listen to billy carson uh billy carson is an mit propulsion scientist a uh, brilliant guy he was nice enough to come on our show one time and talk about the sumerians kings list he was uh talking about the sumerian kings that lived for tens of, or ruled for tens of thousands of years, lived for, for many thousands of years. And, you know, all of us sit there and go, that's bullshit, that's complete bullshit. But if you listen to, you can go on YouTube, anybody can go on YouTube and listen to the um, translated Emerald Tablets. It's, a, it's an audio that people can listen to. And it talks about Toth. Toth was one of the Sumerian kings. Um, and he talks about, this is a 30,000-year-old document, right? The Emerald Tablets are... 30,000 years old. He talks about his craft leaving the earth, uh, the earth being covered in water, coming down in the land of Kim. Uh, this is at the, almost the very start of the whole uh, Emerald Tablets. Coming down to, in the land of Kim. The land of Kim is Egypt. Um, the, the land of Kim's citizens attacking his ship, him extending his staff to the, to the citizens of the land of Kim and through vibration bringing them to their knees. And then they started to worship him, worship him, and they and he ruled over over the land of Kim. So when you put that together with, and I I posed the question to Billy Carson, who again is an MIT propulsion scientist, I said, look, we can't figure out how the how the pyramids were built. There's pyramids being found constantly all over the world. 
Um, we don't have equipment big enough to even move one of those stones, let alone bring it from 500 miles away where the quarry was. Um, is it safe to say that they were built using some form of higher intelligence and vibration to move these stones into place? And he goes, 100%, that's, that's the only way we can figure out that, that, that it was done. Um, so for us to think, uh, you know, that, that there's not been, and societies have gone cyclical as far as for what, what we can tell talking to Graham Hancock and other, other scientists, you know, these civilizations have, have come and gone with time, you know, over many, many, many thousands of years where citizens, uh, where civilizations were rubbed out from, from meteor showers, from floods, from many other uh, things that have happened, uh, where they had, you know, either possessed a much higher level of intelligence than we have today, or had some assistance from somebody else. And so, you know, look, um, for anybody that doubts me, look, if you can figure out how the pyramids were built, go build one. <laughs> go ahead, give it a shot, right? And I think the U.S. Navy, too, has actually gone on record and admitted that unidentified aerial phenomenon exists. Yeah, which is, yeah. yeah, yeah, because naval, uh, naval fighter jets, uh, pilots, you know, there, there, there's a great video out there of those guys going, holy cow, there's a bunch of them. You know, they're talking, they're, they're, they're tracking these things. And, and uh, I mean, that's just one of thousands of, of videos. Now, obviously, many have been uh, proven to be false, but many cannot be proven to be false. And I, th I find it fascinating. I find the whole thing uh, fascinating. People can look up the Sumerian's King's List, read about that. They can look up the uh, Emerald Tablets, and then they can look up the Anunnaki's. And so those three things uh, for research, I mean, can be quite fascinating if, if you want to dive into it. Well, I'll be sure to do that. And if people want to follow you on social media or subscribe to your podcast, I know you also have a YouTube channel. Could you let us know uh, where they could look you up? Brother, um, I'm uh, on Instagram at PJ Militich. On Twitter at, at Pat Milicic, and our website is theconspiracyfarm.com, theconspiracyfarm.com, and all of our all of our um, all of our episodes are on that website, and people can subscribe, give us their email, and and if we get deplatformed, which a lot of people feel with the way things are going, that a lot of our types of shows could get deplatformed uh, because we're spreading what they say is fake news. Um, then we can at least have a massive email list and we can email the show out to everybody uh, if that happens because we've already been demonetized on YouTube, uh, which when you're over the target, you get demonetized on YouTube um, if, you're, if you're hitting on you know, some, some truths. And um, just so people know, I've had a couple guys from the agency, former agency guys, send me these tiny little canvas uh, flapped um, containers that are basically kidnap escape or kidnap escape kits so they've got uh, a picking set a, a handcuff key and a para paracord in it with a little saw almost like a little saw in the middle of it so you can saw through stuff and um it's, it's a, not a very big thing but you can hide it in your sock or whatever and it's pretty funny when you get something like that with a note that says you're over the target you guys need to pay attention and be careful um you know you're you know you're talking about the right stuff and last question here is an amateur wrestler, uh, myself, other than conditioning, what would be the most important thing in your opinion for an amateur wrestler to work on a freestyle amateur wrestler? Uh, besides conditioning, I mean, obviously technique, man, be a technique freak. Um, I mean, go through it with a fine tooth comb, drill it over and over and over and over and over until you can do it in your sleep. And on top of that, just, uh, Know that the pain that you're in, you can inflict more pain uh, by, by just stepping on the gas pedal even harder. Very good. Any closing remarks to close this off? Thank you very much for your time. It's been a privilege to hear from you. No, brother, man. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. I've, I've enjoyed this talk a lot, and, and uh, I think uh, you got a good thing going here, man. We've had a great talk. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free 
and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.